closure. As many of you know, at a later age in life, I made that bold decision to leave the United States, start a new chapter, and move to France. Today, I want to share with you the true story of why I left America and embraced my new life in Europe. One of the biggest concerns was a growing sense of disillusionment with the American dream and way of life. Now, don't get me wrong, I will always be grateful for the opportunities and experiences I had in the States. But as I got older, I began to question the relentless focus on work, productivity, and how I had to hold down two jobs just to exist. I watched friends and colleagues struggle with chronic stress, anxiety, and burnout almost feeling like they had to do more, achieve more, acquire more, to prove their worth. I saw families sacrificing very precious time together in the pursuit of a bigger house, a nicer car, a more impressive job title. I saw women my age having to take retail jobs and stand on their feet six to eight hours a day just to make a living, just to exist. I started to wonder, is this really what life is all about? Is this the legacy I want to leave behind? At the same time, I was struggling with the realities of growing older in a society that often feels youth obsessed. As a woman at my age, I felt increasingly invisible, overlooked and undervalued. It was as if my wisdom, my experience, my unique gifts were no longer seen to be relevant or important because they don't fit into the narrow mold of youth and beauty that our culture celebrates. I began to long for a different way of life. I was familiar with the beauty and value of Europe visiting when I lived in Africa. One that prioritized connection, creativity, and joy over the endless pursuit of achievement and the almighty dollar or Euro the more I learned about the European approach to living, the more I felt compelled to experience it for myself. I found myself reading stories and watching documentaries about women in their later years who are vibrant and passionate with their experiences and respected by their community. Women who are still learning, creating, contributing, and savoring every moment of life with a sense of purpose and delight. I wanted to be part of a culture that saw aging not as a decline, but as an opportunity for growth, wisdom, and self-discovery, and respected for change. And as I began to immerse myself in the history, literature, art, and music of Europe, I felt a deep sense of connection to the romantic, creative spirit that has defined this continent for centuries. From the salons of 1920 Paris, where artists and intellectuals gathered to exchange ideas and inspire one another to the timeless elegance and craftsmanship of French fashion and decor. I longed to be part of a world that used the art of beauty as effortless and with ease. If you have seen Midnight in Paris, you will know why I wanted to be part of a culture where there was an art to living well. Don't get me wrong, I had a wonderful career, raised an amazing daughter, and made so many precious memories. But deep down, there was always this little voice tugging at me. Is this all there is? Is this really the life you want to be living? As I continued to work two jobs and realizing I was not getting any younger, that voice only became louder. I started to realize that life is short and we only get one chance to make it something extraordinary. I didn't want to look back with regret, wondering what if. What if I had been brave enough to chase my dreams? What if I had opened myself up to new adventures, new experiences, new ways of seeing the world? Of course, making the decision to leave behind the life I had built in America was not easy. There were times of fear, doubt, uncertainty, moments when I would wake up in the middle of the night saying, what in the heck am I doing? But deep down, I knew that I couldn't ignore the voice in my heart any longer. I knew that if I didn't take this chance, I would always wonder what might have been. 
And so, with a mixture of excitement and anxiety, I took the leap. I said goodbye to the familiar comforts and routines of my American life. And hello, bonjour, to a world of new possibilities. While the transition wasn't always smooth or easy, I can honestly say that it was the best decision I've ever made. Slowly, day by day, I began to find my footing. I enrolled in French class, explored the cobblestone streets of my new neighborhood, and started to build a community of inspiring expat women who shared my passion for embracing life to the fullest. And the more I immersed myself in this new world, the more I realized that this is where I truly belonged. The French way of life, with its emphasis on savoring simple pleasures, on elevating the everyday through art and beauty, on prioritizing joy and connection over the endless pursuit of more. It spoke to my soul just like I had imagined. I found myself slowing down, being more present, appreciating the magic in small moments. Lingering for hours over a cafe au lait and a warm pan au chocolat at my local boulangerie, strolling through gardens like the ones surrounding me now at Petit Trianon and letting myself get lost in their romance and tranquility, engaging in deep, soulful conversations with fascinating women from all walks of life, each with their own tale of courage and resilience. Because here in Europe, I found a way of life that aligns so much more closely with my values and desires. A life that does not prioritize artificial beauty, but natural beauty. There is creativity and human connection over the constant striving for more. A life that celebrates the wisdom and experience of older generations and sees every stage of the human journey as an opportunity for growth and revelation a generation that gives up a seat on a bus or a train for a woman just like me. Gradually, I realized that this move to France wasn't just about fulfilling a personal dream. It was about shedding the layers of who I thought I was supposed to be and discovering who I really am. It was about taking ownership of my story, my happiness, my purpose. It was about inspiring other women to listen to that little voice inside of them urging them to take a chance on themselves and create a life of beauty, adventure, and meaning no matter their age. This is the sole purpose of me starting my YouTube channel. Of course, no place is perfect, and I've certainly had my share of challenges and frustrations as I've adapted to a new language, culture, and way of being. But through it all, I've discovered a sense of joy, purpose, and belonging that I never knew was possible. Through my stay here, I have met many women, my age and older, who are living a much better life than they ever had elsewhere. I've come to realize that home isn't just a place on a map. It's a feeling in your heart when you're living and staying true to your truth and desires. Now, as I find myself strolling through the exquisite gardens of Petit Trianon, I'm filled with gratitude for the journey that brought me here for the courage to chase my dreams, the resilience to weather life's challenges, and the wisdom to know that it's never too late to start anew. As someone who has taken the leap into the unknown and emerged more alive than ever, I'm here to tell you, life is too short to live someone else's story. It's time to write your own. Whether that means booking that trip you've always dreamed of, learning a new language, pursuing a long-held passion, or simply savoring the beauty and pleasure of everyday moments. I hope my story inspires you to take a step in the direction of your most beautiful life because you deserve the very best. So while leaving America was undoubtedly one of the hardest choices I've ever made, it was also the most rewarding because it gave me the courage to listen to my own heart, to take a chance on myself and to create a life that feels truly, authentically my own. And that is a gift beyond measure, one that I wish for each and every one of you, the gift of living your own unique, beautiful, courageously authentic story, wherever it may lead you.
worst of all, please pardon my kitchen because it is still in the middle of being renovated, redecorated. So just overlook it and pay attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> Maybe that's a better way of saying it. I'm going to make Julia Child's potato and leek soup today. I know that I'm going to go out tomorrow and visit some friends and go to a church and then we're going to go uh, to a restaurant. But you know, I know when I get back home, I'm going to want a little bit of something warm because it's still cold here and rainy and damp. So I'm going to make a little potato leek soup and let's see how it turns out. But first of all, I'm going to cut this part off. Now, I have made leek soup a long time ago, but I've never put potatoes with it. But also, I've never cooked Julia Child's recipe either. I'm going to cut my onions. Now, you know that you cannot have a Julia Child's recipe without having butter. So, of course, we will have lots of butter. You know, Julia Childs brought a lot to our country. When she came back from Paris, she brought back an abundance of recipes and way to cook that American women had never heard of. But I think she was so well-loved because she was so down to earth. I mean, she may have known some of the French words that we didn't know, but we learned when we saw her, but she was just so down to earth. And I remember, yes, I remember watching her in a black and white TV. So I don't know when she went to color, but when I first started watching her, it was a black and white TV. And I want to cut these up just kind of fine as I can so that when I saute them, they'll all become tender at the same time. I don't like to have great big chunks of food. And I love cooking. When uh, Hadassah suggested that I do a cooking segment with Julia Childs, because, you know, she started out, out in France, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I have enough butter. <laughs> but you know, with Julia Childs, all she ever did is use tons of butter. I don't know if we ever use that much butter now, but she understood the French way of cooking, and it was the quality of the ingredients. She went to the market, and she picked out her onions and she picked out a certain type of potato that she used. Now I am going to use the chicken bouillon cube because I don't have any chicken stock and I love the bouillon cubes here in France because they're not salty like the ones in the United States because if you use a bouillon cube in the United States well I just never did use one I might have used a quarter of one if I ever used one but it was so packed with salt so uh, and I can already tell down my eyes are uh, tearing up because of the onion. So I'm going to start with my bouillon cube and get a little bit of broth going there. Now, if you're wondering what kind of oven I have, I have an induction oven and I love it because certain pots go on it. You can't just put any pot on it, but when you turn it on, it stays the same temperature, and when you turn it off, it immediately goes off. I mean, it doesn't stay around very long. It's not like you can't touch it because it's just one of those great ovens. And I found the other day, because I need so much more space if I want to do a cooking segment once a month, that you could buy like a butcher block or something to go over the top of your induction oven so you could have more counter space. Max, the soup is not for you, I'm sorry. Anyway, let's get out the butter and I'll let it start softening up and the potatoes and I'll start cutting them up. Now I have omega-3 demi cell, which that means a little bit of salt. <laughs> Just a little bit of salt, but it's good butter. Uh, it's very good, but I want to let it soften up a little bit. And then I want to get out my potatoes. Now, I got out, I bought white potatoes because I like white potatoes. But, had I found some red potatoes, I would have used them also. And you're just going to have to pardon me because I do have tears coming down my face at the moment. And I will wash my potatoes as soon as I get to peeling them. I don't want to make enough for an army, but I do know that this will freeze quite well. 
I'm trying to look at the recipe as I go along. Oh my goodness, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to dab my eyes for a second because, oh goodness, the tears. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the tears are just too much. Oh gosh. I didn't realize the tears were gonna be that much. I just for a little bit of onion there. Let's see, how much onion do I need? It says to save what you don't use. It doesn't really say. So I think I'm just gonna use my own, I think I'm just gonna use my own imagination. And if you've ever made this soup before, you can tell me what you did that I didn't do. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. I'm having to dig in my, um, I'm having to dig in my cabinets for some of my utensils because, you know, everything's kind of been in an uproar here because of redecorating. And they're coming back in a few weeks to finish. Well, next, not this week, but the April the 8th. They're coming back to finish the painting and then they're gonna put down my new flooring. I'm so excited. So there's my chicken stock right there. And I will taste it, but I won't taste it until the soup is finished. Okay, so there's my chicken stock, and I'm going to put it right over there. And I'm going to finish peeling my potatoes. I like to chop them up a little bit the same also and not so big, but that they'll cook evenly. Tomorrow's Easter. I don't know when you'll see this video, but tomorrow's Easter Sunday. And I've been invited to go to another little town. I have to take a train to go to. It's about 15 minutes away from Fontainebleau. And these young men that have just uh, come to France came from France from San Diego. And I know this last month they've been freezing to death. I don't even talk to them about the weather because I know they are coming from San Diego. I'm going to start sauteing my onions and I'm going to do just what Julia Charles would have done. I am not going to take any olive oil, although it does say to take olive oil, but I'm just going to Julia Charles it up a little bit more and I'm going to use butter. So I'm just going to put a little bit of butter there. Let that melt. I think that's better than oil anyway. Especially if you're using real butter. That's just my opinion. And since I'm making this soup for me, it's not like I need to make it for a ton of people. I don't want to have potato leek soup for the next two years. And I don't like to freeze things because honestly, I don't have enough room in my little refrigerator. Uh, my freezer has one ice tray in it, and that is sufficient. Uh, well, it's probably not sufficient, but that's all I can get in there. So I'm gonna make all of this a little bit more for one person than for a family of four, because I don't really have the uh, area to clean it, but I think I want a few more onions there. Okay, okay, bye. Let's don't burn while we're doing a demo here. Let's not set up, set off the uh, fire alarm. So there's my onions that I want to saute. And I think I cut them fine enough that, um, because I just want to get them a little brown. There's my stock there. And this is just, you know, just want to stir and get them a little brown. Not too many onions, but I, like I said, I'm only making it just for me, not for an army. So I am going to take all my little pieces of onions here and put them in there. And then I'm going to take my potatoes and I'm going to put them in my chicken stock or my bouillon cube or whatever you want to call it 
and I'm not going to put too many potatoes in there either. But I have one little bit of onion left here. I'm so sorry. My sinuses and my eyes are flowing. <laughs> I just will tell you that for sure. I will tell you that for sure. Okay, so let's see how long do I have to cook this. Okay. Now, see, I would think a certain thing, but I need to make sure that that I do it the right way. Now, I need to put some water in it a little bit, just so it's not too much. Okay. It calls for three cups of potatoes and three cups of diced onions, which I'm not going to do. I care for my onions. I think they need to be a little bit more so that I can kind of see them, you know, so they kind of see through. And I'm going to put my little bouillon and my potatoes back on here. I don't normally use this large pot or this large um, area on my stove, so I, sometimes I kind of have to fiddle around to see where it is. Okay, I think my onions are lucid. I think that's the word, lucid? enough that I can pour it in. And I really have to tell you, Max has been standing here and he's been really good. Usually when I get into the kitchen, he barks because he thinks he's getting something, which he normally does, but this is a video. <laughs> I don't need him barking. So there's my little bit of soup. And it really is going to be for one person. But I want to add... Some water and I want to add some hot water because my uh, bouillon is already hot so I want to add some hot water just so that I can cook it a little bit I'm not going to put any salt and pepper in it at the moment I'm gonna let that cook and I think I'm going to um, let that be Back down, I'm gonna take it back down to a five and let that cook, because it's not gonna take too long for that to cook, it's not that much. And then I'm gonna put like a little lid on it to keep the steam in there and to sting those little leeks and those little potatoes. And here's a little lid. Oh my goodness, I'm so apologetic for my nose and, <laughs> and my eyes just, just tearing up, but you know what it's like when you're cutting up onions. So anyway, I'm gonna take my lid and I'm gonna put it over here and I'm going to put a timer on for about 15 minutes. And I'll come back and see what it's, what it's doing then because it won't take those potatoes too long to cook, nor the onions. So let's see what kind of Julia Child's recipe is gonna look like. To quote Julia Charles, bon appétit. Au revoir. Bonjour. Good morning. I wanted to show you today a little bit of a classic French skincare routine that I do. And I start off with double cleansing with an oil based cleanser to remove, you know, all the makeup and impurities. And I use Clinique. And fortunately, I can buy Clinique here in my town of Fontainebleau. I like it because it's gentle, it's water-based, and it refreshes and balances. And I have very sensitive skin. And if you'll notice, when I do put my cleanser on or anything else, I stay away from my eyes as much as possible because that seems to be my area that I have a lot of issues with. But I like the way it goes on, and then it just makes me feel very clean when I get it all the way taken care of and yes you try to do your own little spa technique as much as you can to get that in there and get that blood circulating i have that little line right there and i like to do the little circulating and get that blood going so we can get rid of some of those little marks 
In fact, I'm going to get a professional uh, facial on Wednesday, and I can't wait to take you along with me for that. It's always so nice to use a little warm water to take it off. And very impressed. There's not really a lot of dirt. That's pretty nice. Now for hydration, I use a lightweight, non-greasy moisturizer. In fact, I found this in London. My daughter and I went last Christmas, and she said, oh, Mom, this is Charlotte Tilbury's Magic Cream. She said, you can't afford that. And I said, Jennifer, don't tell me what I can't afford. And I did buy it, and then I've also gone back to uh, Galleries Lafayette and purchased another little bit of Tilbury's Magic Cream. As you can tell, I use just a little bit on a Q-tip so that I'm not using too much because it really is not necessary to use too much. It has got rosehip in it. Uh, it has hyaluronic acid, peptides. It really is a velvety texture once you put it on and I love to indulge my skin with it. Sometimes you just need to make sure you have a little extra moisture on your neck also. I have such dry skin, I have to make sure that everything feels very velvety. <laughs> My lips, everything. I want everything moisturized with this magic cream. It is lovely. Of course, the next thing I do is sun protection. I bought it here in the uh, pharmacy in France. You will also see that I also use a Q-tip to put it on because I don't want too much and I keep it away from my eyes. There's just no reason not to put on that little SPF because even if it's cloudy or cold, we just need to prevent premature aging or if we're already aging, we need to prevent any more aging and keep the damage away from our skin from the UV rays. You know, we have targeted treatments like incorporating serums or masks with active ingredients like I used before that you saw. And I love doing that to help with lymphatic drainage and, and just have a healthy glowing complexion. I just think we need to take a little bit of time every day to take care of our skin. Now this is a highlighter from Charlotte Tilbury that I purchased in London also and it really helps give a little bit of highlight to some of your dark spots and items like that and I've enjoyed using it. I'm not sure that I can tell the difference between the Clinique one that I used for many years but I do like it. The real magic of French Beauty I think is to realize that you don't need all this caked on makeup, you don't need all this eyeliner, you don't need all this eyeshadow. It just needs to look natural. And I think that's what I've adapted to since I've been here. Now you can tell today, since I am putting all this makeup on, that I am going to be videoing. But also, I'm meeting some people that have come in from California and visiting Paris and they, they're coming in to see me today. But most of the time, I put on my uh, Magic Cream, I put on my SPF, and then I put on a little lipstick and that's all I put on when I go into town. And if I'm just in the house, I just put on my Magic Cream and my lipstick. But today I'm doing a little bit more. This is Charlotte Tilbury. pencil, which I dearly love, and Max got a hold of it the other day, so I have less of it than I should have, but I really like it. It goes on very smooth, very soft, and then, of course, I have the Charlotte Tilbury lipstick that I use. This is my little moisture surge that I put on, but you can tell that I only use just a little bit. I don't use a lot. In fact, I remember at one time I used a lot more than I do now. Just a little bit of coverage. Just to give that little bit of glow, cover up some of those imperfections. It's about celebrating the miracle of your own being and all its wild, wonderful, perfectly imperfect glory.
And you, when you do that, I promise you, the world is going to be a more beautiful place for you. We've just got to look in the mirror and really see us and not see the fine lines and not see the little lines between our forehead. It's just, we're very pretty. All of us are very pretty in our own way. I love to put my lipstick on before everything is finished because then when I look in the mirror, I feel like part of me is already done. And if I happen to have to walk out of the room without my mascara on, at least I have lipstick on. For lipstick to me is the number one thing to wear. Now this is Lancome and it is a white substance that goes on your eyelashes to make them look a little bit longer. You know, the French have a great approach to skincare and makeup. It is just more about enhancing the natural radiance with a few simple high quality products and techniques. Now you can see I use uh, Lancome on my lashes to strengthen my lashes to make them look a little longer. And then I use Clinique. I love this new Clinique that has just come out. It's in a bright green uh, packaging and I found it in London when I went to Boots Pharmacy. And if you ever go to London, Boots is a fabulous place to buy anything and everything. And then of course, you know, you have to go out of the house smelling good. <laughs> now, the hair. <laughs> Let's get the straightener out. When I wake up in the morning, I just look crazy. I have uh, my little satin pillowcase has kind of gone by the wayside. So now I wake up and my hair is really not what I want it to be. Thank goodness I'm having it colored next week. <laughs> This is just a little cream that my stylist gave me. Well, I bought from my stylist. And it just kind of keeps down the little hairs. And also it keeps my part of my hair that, you know, I use the flat iron on because it gets damaged more than the rest of the hair because I only use it on the sides and on my bangs. So I use this to kind of seal in my ends and kind of rescue any damage that I've done to my hair. And I always kind of dab it around, use it on my bangs. I don't use very much, just a little bit. It is very windy today, so I'm using some hairspray. And the last little part, just to kind of use it to... Oh, this is where I go to get my spa. Love this. And just kind of moisturizes my face just a little bit more and I'm done Bonjour, hello, how are you today? I just came into my office and I thought that I would just get together with my little calendar and make sure that the itinerary that I have with my friend, because we're going to the Chelsea Flower Show, and I need to make sure that the dates are okay because we have some items like the day we go to the Chelsea Flower Show and we're going to Windsor Castle, and there's just some things that we already have paid tickets, you know, we bought our tickets, so we want to go ahead and make sure that everything kind of goes together, and I like doing itinerary so that's my thing and I got to thinking about me traveling my first time coming to Europe was uh, many many years ago I was in my late 20s and my husband and I were moving to Cameroon West Africa so uh, that was the first time I'd ever been to London anyway you talk about a girl with wide eyes coming to London but I'm glad we came to London first because if I had gone to Paris first and not known the language I would have really felt uncomfortable but anyway I've been traveling for, you know, a long time because I'm an older lady, you know. So I just want to let you know, traveling is not just an opportunity for us to see things. It's an opportunity for us to feel things. And people always ask me, Janice, why did you move to Fontainebleau? 
I moved to Ponte Blue because I felt it in my heart. I got off that bus and I looked around. I said, this is where I want to be. So anyway, when you go uh, to visit another country, and also, you know, the Olympics are coming up. So a lot of people are going to be visiting. And I hope you do take a little uh, time to listen to this. But come with an open mind. And come with the openness that you're not in your country anymore. (laughs) That you're in their country. So... Pay attention to the rules and pay attention to the laws. And if you need to know something, research it before you ever get here. I saw a couple the other day and they had like a little white ticket. I have a Navigo Pass that I use for my train. And some people get the little white paper tickets. But make sure when you get on a train or tube, if you haven't gone through one of the styles to use your ticket, look around and find it because they're going to be some little machine or something, and you need to tap it and make sure that you validate it. If not, they're going to detain you, they're going to give you a ticket, and they may just ask for the money right then and there as soon as you get off the train or wherever you are that they find that you have not validated it. So find out what some of the rules are before you ever get here. And then just enjoy. Slow down and just immerse yourself in the culture. You know, people say, what is there to eat? You know, give me a name of a restaurant that's great there. They're all good. But I like to try the little restaurants around the corner, not the ones on the main drag. They're just as good, and they're a little bit cheaper. But if you want to be on the main drag because you want to people watch, go right ahead. Because I have never had any bad food in a restaurant in France. I mean, seriously, it's Paris, right? (laughs) So first and foremost, if you're not going to be here because of the Olympics, you're just coming over to visit. You might be able to do what I love to do and what I encourage you to do, and that is embrace the culture, slow down, find you a bench, have a little picnic on it, or maybe you just want to try one of the many chocolates that we have, and sit down on the bench and eat your chocolate slow. Enjoy the chocolate. Don't inhale it. And while you're eating your chocolate, look around you. Immerse yourself. Watch the people. Look at the nature around you. Feel the breeze. Feel the sunshine on your face. It honestly will give you a more memorable experience wherever you travel, whether it be France or anywhere else. You know, so many people want to come to Paris for five days and they want to cram everything in, plus going to Versailles one day or maybe going to Monet's house one day. And by the time they get through and they get on the plane to go back home or the train to go back home or wherever they're going to, They haven't really seen anything. They really didn't get to, you know, experience it. They got to see it and move on. They got to see it and move on. And I guess that that's what you want to tell people is, I got to see the Eiffel Tower, but I didn't get to experience going up to the top. Why? Get your tickets ahead of time. You can buy your tickets ahead of time. Now, I don't know about the Olympics, but most of the time you can buy your tickets ahead of time. But enjoy what's here. Pick four or five things that you really want to see. If you're wanting to go to a museum, then choose that museum accordingly. Not in a rush, not because you've got to be out by 1.30 because you have an appointment at 2.30 to go somewhere else. Choose a day that you can savor and not be rushed. Linger longer. Absolutely, give yourself permission to linger longer and you will come back with some fabulous memories. There are so many things to do in Paris. You can just spend half of a day just sitting at a sidewalk cafe, drinking uh, coffee or drinking a glass of wine, people watching, getting lost on those cobblestone streets. Don't worry about getting off the main road, the main area that you're in. Take those side streets because those are really the most charming. And then you take the train to go to Versailles or maybe come see me in Fontainebleau. Enjoy it. That's why there are a lot of times that when I go places, I really like to do Airbnbs. Sometimes I do hotel rooms, but the Airbnbs are always situated in an area where you can go to the local grocery store and you can eat at local restaurants. It really is a different ambiance than staying in a hotel. And there are so many classes that you can go to while you're in Paris. You can go to a cooking class. You can go to a wine and cheese class. I mean, it is limitless to what you can do here. So take an opportunity to slow down and enjoy. And of course, you know, let's go back to eating because everyone loves to come to Paris to eat. We just have the best. We have the best pastries. We have the best patisseries. We have the best boulangeries. We have the best cheese. We have the best wine. 
take time to savor. All of us have a phone with an app on it, like a Google app for translating. Go into a wine shop or a cheese shop and look at a cheese that you're not familiar with. I know when I first came here, I stayed with the Parmesan, I stayed with the Swiss cheese, and um, I even bought cheddar at one time. But try your palate on some cheese that you have not ever tried before and also some wine. And you may even want to go to the wine country and experience going to a vineyard. Slow down, enjoy your time. That's the theme of this little talk. <laughs> and of course, if you're like me, you like flea markets and I like vintage stores to buy clothing that's been slightly used before. So check on your internet, put that on your schedule. You'll meet local people. You'll meet people that are trying to do just what you are, trying to get that special little outfit or maybe that special scarf or something. And that's where I got this <laughs> at a little vintage shop. But um, try out some local places. Don't just try the big stores. Yes, it's great to go to Galleries Lafayette and that's the best place in the world to go see Paris and you can go to the very top for free. Of course, everyone wants to go to Galleries Lafayette. I love to go to Galleries Lafayette. But instead of pushing and shoving with the crowd, uh, go up to the top, enjoy a little bit of lunch, and it's free, and the view is free, and it's beautiful up there. But go to that restaurant on the corner. Go to that little cheese shop, the small cheese shop, not the large cheese shops, the small ones. And if they don't speak English, it's okay. You already know bonjour. You know, merci, and you know, excuse moi. So just wait your turn. Ooh, use your patience and go into some of the smaller stores. And it's really delightful. I'm telling you, it's a real experience on its own. When I first traveled in Europe, I went to countries and I had an itinerary. At nine o'clock, we do this. At 9.35, we do this. At 10.30, we do this. And that is so not the way I travel anymore. The whole point is not to have a scripted uh, schedule, not to have that itinerary. Of course, you want to have some dates of some places that you have made, you know, that you have bought tickets for, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, on the whole, just go with the flow. I went to a little town called Nevers, and I didn't have an agenda. I just went to this small town. I walked from the train station to this convent where I stayed, and it was lovely, and I just started shopping, going around, and no one spoke English. I didn't even speak French. And that was before <laughs> Google Translate. I even had my hair done there. So don't be, don't be scared about the language. Enjoy what is around you. Just make sure that you immerse yourself and your soul into what you're doing instead of running around like a chicken with our heads cut off. I hope these little ideas that I've given you have inspired you to travel. And if so, please let me know some of your travel experiences. Do you have to have an itinerary or can you go without an itinerary? What has been your most memorable trip? Let me know. I need to get back to working on London. As I stood here, my gaze was drawn to the mesmerizing checkered floors beneath my feet. The perfect symmetry of black and white squares seemed to stretch out endlessly before me, each one a representation of the duality that exists within all of our lives. The light and the dark, the joy and the sorrow, the triumphs and the struggles, all of it was contained with this simple yet profound pattern. As I traced my fingers along the cool, smooth surface of the marble, I couldn't help but feel a deep connection to the passion and creativity that had gone into this incredible space. It was a testament to the enduring power of art and the way in which it can continue to inspire and move us even hundreds of years after its creation. I felt a profound sense of purpose and clarity wash over me. I knew that my own journey had led me to this very moment, and I knew, like the artisans who had created this magnificent hall, 
I, too, wanted to leave my own work of art behind in this world, a work that would represent my passions, my dreams, and the courage it had taken for me to leave behind the familiar and strike out on my own path, a work that would inspire other women to have the courage to live a life of their own choosing, free from the constraints and expectations that so often hold us back. I knew that every step of my journey, every challenge I had faced and overcome, had been leading me towards this greater purpose. The lifestyle brand I was building, the community I was creating, the stories I was telling, they were all part of this larger work of art, a work that would endure long after I was gone, hopefully inspiring generations of women to come to embrace their own duality, their own passions and dreams, and to have the courage to create a life that truly reflected who they were. You know, the reason I started this YouTube was to help other people. And I wanted to help people change their lives. I wanted to say, hey, you don't have to move to France like me, but I want you to change your life. I want you to live your dream. I want you to do something that you want to do, something you're passionate about. And you know what? I get so many comments all the time. And you guys are helping me more, I think, than I'm helping you. It has just been fabulous, all the latest comments I've received. And you wouldn't believe the amount of people that want to move to France. Now, I do get a few that want to move to Portugal and Spain, but I'm going to just talk about France. I just had some friends. And when I say friends, if I've met you one time and we've smiled and we've joked together, we're friends. And I had two lovely men come to see me last March, matter of fact, and we visited together and they had been researching Fontainebleau. And then they came across my video and they came across other people's videos and they started watching me. So when they came to Fontainebleau to see if this is where they wanted to land, because they already knew they were moving to France, they just didn't have it narrowed down exactly where. So they came to visit me and we had uh, coffee together one day, and then a couple of days later we had lunch, it was lovely. Then we started corresponding with each other, and you know, it was just like three months left, two months left, four days left. I mean, just been there with each other during the whole event, because I know what they were going through. So we kind of could relate to each other. But they said that I did encourage them, even though France, you know, had been under their watchdog for a while and they were already under construction and they knew they were going to move because he had already received his um, EU from um, Poland. So he knew he was moving and his partner, they all, you know, they already, you know, figured it out. They were going to move. But he said, when he watched me and he said, you know what, of a 70 year old lady, that's single <laughs> and uh, lives by herself and has a desire to move. And if she can do it, by golly, we can do it too. And I just love them. In fact, I just spent Easter with them. So I'm telling you what, you guys are helping me more, I think, than I help you. And that was one person. And he said he went to different forums and he watched anything and everything he could on France. And that sounds just like what I did. If you're wanting to move, contact anyone, contact everyone. Just throw it out there and see if anyone will answer you. Okay. There is another woman, she is a teacher and she's 66 years old. And she emailed me the other day, because sometimes on the comments, I don't want to go into too much detail. And I don't really want you guys to go into too much detail because, you know, you may be wanting to ask me something that you don't want everybody else and his brother to know about. So she was telling me that she's a teacher and she wants to move to Paris. And she was trying to figure out how much money. And everybody always asked me that question. How much money? I don't know. I'm a retired school teacher with Social Security and two pensions. Figure it out. If you make as much or if you make more than that, you can make it happen. I don't know if you can make it happen in Paris. And this is what I told this woman. I don't know if you can live as comfortable in Paris. And she said, if I can't live in Paris, I'm not coming. And I said, well, then let me tell you. You can find what you need in Paris. 
I could have found what I needed in Paris, except I didn't want to be in Paris. I wanted to be outside of Paris. And of course, you know, you know, you've heard the story. I got off the bus in Fontainebleau, I saw the carousel, I saw the cobblestones, and I said, I'm here, this is me. <laughs> and she wants to live in Paris. So that means that she probably is going to live in a one bedroom apartment, but that's okay. Her dream is to live in Paris. So we have emailed each other back and forth and she is retiring this year and she's going to come out this summer and she's going to look around to see what arrondissement she wants to be in, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't wait to meet her. We're gonna have coffee or lunch, one or the other. And I can't wait to meet her because she has her set schedule of what she wants to do and she's leaving three children behind. So she also talked to me about how did I feel about leaving my daughter? Well, of course I miss my daughter, but you know what? I still give everything to my daughter and I'm in France. And she calls me every day, so we are very much connected. Thank goodness for technology. I don't know that I could have done this 10 years ago, I left my daughter, but I have. But anyway, we had that in common. So that is a, a question that she was really interested in asking me, how do you deal with not being around your daughter? So. Um, it was very interesting talking to her. Then I have another woman that I've been talking to for about probably two years. And she started out on my Facebook and then she started following me on Instagram and then she follows me on my YouTubes. But um, so finally we've been talking a little bit more about her coming to France. Last summer she traveled and she went to about five or six different countries. I believe if I'm not mistaken, she went on a Rick Steves tour and so then she was talking about going on a tour or a cruise or something I don't know but anyway it was only going to be I guess it wasn't a cruise I get anyway it was only going to be in France and she said well I can I can go to this and that and I thought wait a minute if you're trying to figure out a place to live you can't go on a tour because they're going to just show you this this and that you know that's what I like to do. And if I'm going to do that kind of tour, I just want to see what's good because I only have like five days. But if I'm thinking about living there, I want to take a long time. When I decided I wanted to move to Europe, I took six weeks. I went to Scotland, several places in France. I went to Poland. I went to Hungary. I went to uh, Austria, Italy. I just wanted to see my my problem was my heart was in France, but I thought, okay, is that is that real? And I'd go to these other countries and I'd say, yeah, it is real. It, it really is real. So then when I got back to France, I said, okay, now I need to start looking here. But then I was talking to this lady and she said, you know what? You're right, Janice. Let me check out little towns like Fontainebleau. And there's other little towns also. Fontainebleau isn't the only little town around. It's just the one that I came to. And uh, I said, but, you know, if you want to live in Nice, because a lot of people like to live in Nice, and there's a big expat group in Nice. And there's even another expat group, a large expat group in Normandy area. A lot of them are British, and they live near the area where the ferry is, so they can go back you know, and visit their family and friends there in the UK. But a lot of people live in Nice. In fact, there is a lovely lady named Ann Scott, and she should be in Nice sometime this week. And she has a YouTube channel called Go, uh, Postcards of My Golden Years. And she's lovely. And she has done so much research. So she would know all about living in Nice because I will tell you this, it is not a blank slate. What Janice did in Fontainebleau, I can go to Paris and do that. I can get an apartment. No, it's not the same. I want to get my uh, uh, visa renewed, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. Because Janice did this, it'll be okay for me to do that. Nice. No, every area is different. If you're not wanting to be in Paris, and you love the warm weather, I think the south of France would be absolutely perfect for you. I don't like hot weather. I hate hot weather. So I put up with dreary weather for two months out of the year because I don't want to live in Nice. I don't care if I do have an air conditioner because then when I go out, I still need an air conditioner unless I can carry one on my back. So 
going back, so she's now going to come into Paris and then she's going to come in Fontainebleau and we're going to visit and I'm going to talk to her about, you know, what it's like to live here in a small town because it isn't like living in the States at all. And then you put yourself in a small town, now you're really jeopardizing yourself if you want something large. You know, you want to live in a larger area. So there's a lot to be considered. But going back to the beginning of why I started talking about this is I know that I've helped some people. And I know that it is helpful to speak out to someone that speaks your own language, that you can ask questions to. And I love that I can do that for you. But trust me, your comments to me, I think are more helpful than my comments to you. I really do. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. I just wanted to say, whew, the last month has really been a tough one. And I thank you for sticking around with me and I thank you for asking me you know, where am I? When is my next video going to come out? It really meant a lot to me. Other than the um, chaos going around in my house, which I'm very pleased to have, but still chaos, uh, the painting and all of that. Right in the middle of that, we had Buster who became very ill. And those of you that have been with me for quite a long time, you know that Buster came over here with me. And we got Max, um, <laughs> 18 months ago um, in Normandy. So Max is a new member of the family. Buster had been around for 16 years. Kitty's been around for 15. But anyway, uh, Buster became very ill and I had noticed it and I knew it was coming. I just didn't know it was gonna come that fast. So there was, Max, I'm doing a video. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm trying to finish this video, Max. Will you let me finish the video? I'll give you a treat. Oh! oh. <laughs> that got some looks. <laughs> anyway, it's been a really tough month when it comes to losing an, an animal. It's very difficult, uh, as you all know. So, uh, that kind of put production behind for a little bit, and I needed to learn some new techniques. <laughs> And I needed to uh, kind of heal and just do some things just for me. Uh, and for me meant, you know, not rushing around. I just needed to spend some time with myself. So as you can tell, it's pretty daylight outside, but we've changed time now. We just changed last week. And uh, it is now time for me to write in my journal. And uh, believe it or not, it is almost Max's bedtime. He goes to bed at 8.30, so it's like eight o'clock. So he's hanging in there. And of course, he's gonna have to have some, you know, treats or something before he goes to bed so he can be good. But honestly, at 8.30, the dog is out. You'll look around and see where Max is. Max is asleep and he stays asleep all night long. So anyway, uh, he just likes to play right before. But thank you so much for sticking with me. Thank you for being patient with me. And thank you for asking about me. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as you all enjoyed the last one. And please leave comments because you know what? We don't know unless you let us know, right? That's right. How much do we love you? Are you gonna tell them goodbye? Max says goodbye. <laughs> as always, au revoir. <laughs> Max, tell them you are going to get a beauty salon appointment soon, okay? <laughs> Ciao, everyone. <laughs>